Amen. Thank you, Larry. We've been blessed for these last three weeks to have Larry playing for us in worship. I think you're going back to Pennsylvania this week, huh? So uh, next week we'll welcome Connor Spencer back. It's been a joy to have Larry joining us. So we're glad to be here in this room and out there uh, gathered for worship. It's a joy to worship God together on this wonderful, bright, warm Sunday here in Eagle River. So I'm glad now to ask Jean to lead us in worship. Okay, please stand for the call to worship. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my eyes, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. And let us pray. God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the first hymn today is hymn number 321, The Church is One Foundation.
Now hear the call to confession. We know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Let us in freedom confess the wrong we have done. Let us pray together. Merciful God, you made us in your image with a mind to serve you and serve you. But our knowledge is imperfect, our love inconsistent, our obedience is imperfect. Tender love, forgive us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please continue confessing your sins in the silence of your hearts. Hear the good news. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, we are justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. And please be seated. So I want to talk to the kids, the ones in the room and the ones in your living rooms or family rooms or kitchens, wherever you are. So Claire and George and Abigail, look around in the sanctuary. Do, does everybody in here look alike? No, you don't think so? You don't think we all look alike? Okay, look at all the people in your row. Do you all look alike? <laughs> no, a little bit, right? But what, if you look alike, Abigail, if you look like Claire and George and your mom and your dad, why do you think that is? Why? Because you're related, right? Because they're your sisters and your brother, right? So I have two brothers. And one of them is not very much younger than me, like one year younger than me. And when we were little, everybody thought we were twins because we were the same size and we looked just alike. And it made me mad because I didn't want to look like him, right? And now he's really a grown-up like me and he's a lot taller than me. He's like six feet something. But when we're together, people still think we look like twins because we still look alike. I have more hair than he does, but, you know, that's a lot, right? So... But I think the reason we look alike, why do we look alike? Because we have the same mom and dad, right? And so we have the same uh, genetic heritage, right? And I have a son, and he has a little boy who's 10 months old now. And if you took a picture of my son Cameron and his little boy Anders at 10 months old, they look exactly alike, right? Because Cam's Anders' dad. So, but when we look around the church, we don't look alike, right? We don't all look alike. Some of us look more like each other than depending on how old we are. But one of the things that happens when we grow in faith is that we start to look alike on the inside, right? So the sermon today is going to talk about what that looks like, about growing in faith and growing closer to Jesus, and how when God changes us, he doesn't change us so we all look alike on the outside. I mean, maybe if we had too much chocolate at church potlucks, we'd all, like, look fat together, right? But God changes us so we look alike on the inside right? George, that was funny, wasn't it? (laughs) Yeah, we ate too much chocolate and cheese, right? But God changes us so that we look alike on the inside, so that we're growing and changing and trying to follow Jesus. So when we look around and we think, oh, we don't look alike at all, it's really not true because we look alike on the inside. It's our brothers and sisters and our parents and our grandbabies that we look alike on the outside. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for our family the families we were born into, and the families you create in your love. Help us as you transform us by your spirit to look more alike as we grow in faith every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the word of God from Psalm 89. We'll be reading verses 1 through 4 and verses 20 through 37. Psalm 89. 
I will sing of the Lord great love forever with my mouth. I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, forever, and you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. And now from uh, verse 20. I have found David my servant with my sacred oil. I have anointed him. My hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen him. The enemy will not get the better of him. The wicked will not oppress him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down his adversaries. My faithful love will be with him, and through my name his horn will be exalted. I will set his hand over the sea, his right hand over the rivers. He will call out to me, You are my Father, my Rock, my God, the Rock of my salvation. I will appoint him to be my Savior, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. I will maintain my love to him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne, as long as the heavens endure. If his son forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and fail to follow my commands, I will punish their sin with the rod, their iniquity with flogging. But I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness that I did not lie to David, that his line will continue forever and his throne endure before me like the sun. It will be witness, it will be established forever like the moon, the faithful witness in the sky. And Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Larry. And now as we continue to worship God, let us pray together. Holy and almighty God, we thank you for all the ways that you speak your word to us through music, through laughter, through prayer, through the hearing and studying of your word. So as we continue to hear your word, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds that all that we say and do, the words of my mouth and the meditations and prayers of each and every one of our hearts would bring honor and glory to you, O God, because you are our rock and our salvation. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our Old Testament lessons, we have two. We're studying the prophets and continuing to tell the story of David today. And so our Old Testament lessons today come first from 2 Samuel, verses 7, 1 through 14a. We've been working our way through the story of David. So last week we saw David dancing before the Lord as he has been anointed king over all Judah and Israel. And now today David brings the ark home. Or he wants, last week he brought the ark home. This week he wants to build a palace for God. So let's hear the word of the Lord. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to David, came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I haven't dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and I appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on the earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offering to offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his people forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. And here ends the lesson from Second Samuel. As we're walking this month through everyday prophets, today we get to hear from the prophet Jeremiah. It's chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. God says through the mouth of his prophet, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. And here ends the lesson from Jeremiah. And as we continue our walk through the Gospel of Mark, today we look at the continuation of Mark chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 30 and 30, 30 through 34, and then 53 through 56. 
The Revised Common Lectionary leaves out, those missing verses are two uh, really important stories. One of Jesus walking on the water and one of Jesus feeding 5,000 people. So next week we're going to look at the story of Jesus feeding 5,000 people. But you'll see in a minute why we're just looking at these two separate passages. So the apostles had been teaching and healing, right? Jesus sent them out in his name and now they've come back. So they gathered around Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they didn't have a chance even to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And now here's verses 53 through 56. When they had crossed over, they, uh, in Jesus' time, they didn't u- only use a boat to sail from one side of the lake or the top of the lake to the bottom. They used a boat to just kind of go along the shore, right? So that's what's happening. They've just taken a little jaunt and they've um, gone, uh, gone around the north side of the lake. So when they crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and they carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Here ends the lesson from the gospel. Remember several weeks ago we told the story of how Jesus was in a crowd and there was a woman who'd been suffering for 12 years and no doctors had been able to heal her and she thought to herself, if I just touch the edge of his cloak, I'll be healed. Remember that story? So clearly the people in the towns knew that and she'd been telling the good news of her healing. So we get to hear that it was still happening. And then finally, we've been studying Ephesians. So today we're looking at chapter 2. Verses 11 through 22. And Paul the Apostle is talking about what does the church look like? What's your, what's your new identity as the church? So he says, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by, the, by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit." Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And here in the lesson from Ephesians, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we've been talking all summer about being disciples, about our identity in Christ Jesus, and our growth in discipleship, because that's what being disciples means, is growing in discipleship. Growth that often takes unexpected turns and happens in unexpected ways. So today's text give us three roots for our identity in Jesus Christ, who we are, and three fruits, roots and fruits, right? For our growth, the texts give us those roots and fruits in three different ways. So the first root for our identity, as we see it in these three texts, 
is that we have, because we are followers of Jesus, a people to belong to, to whom to belong. Maybe that's better grammar. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church in the Ephesus region, okay? So not just the church in Ephesus, but all the little towns in the region around Ephesus. And he was explaining their new identity in Christ Jesus. He said, because of Jesus, there are no more barriers between people. The Jews, for Paul, were the chosen people. Through Abraham, through the long ago when God called Abraham from nowhere and sent him to a land he did not know and said, I will make you a chosen people. And then they were delivered by Moses. Yet now, the apostle says, through Jesus' sacrifice, everyone is part of the new covenant. Everyone has access to forgiveness and reconciliation. Paul says, and this is 21st century language, but it's clear in the text. Paul says that outsiders are transformed to insiders. Paul says that all of us, the chosen ones and the not chosen ones, are aliens and foreigners. That's a technical term in Hebrew for people who were not part of God's chosen ones. Okay, but Paul says in Jesus Christ, we're all aliens and foreigners. So if you grew up inside the church, like I did, some of us in here are that way, we grew up inside the church, we tend to define ourselves by who we are not. Even if we live in Alaska, or in Chugiak Eagle River, or Anchorage, or whatever our cultural setting, we tend to define ourselves by who we are not. We're not Canadians. We're not valley people, right? We're not Muslims. We're not Methodists. We're not moms, right? We tend to define ourselves by who we are not. Scripture defines us differently by who we are. We're one people, the church. I read an article this week, it was very cool. It was probably five or six years old, so it was pre-COVID. And right now, sort of all the articles and the studies I read are in my head pre-COVID and current COVID and post-COVID, because COVID has, the pandemic has informed and impacted how we teach, right, and how we think. And so this one was pre-COVID, but it wasn't that long ago, maybe 2015 or something. And, and somebody, Christianity Today or a seminary, went to many well-known preachers and theo theologians and said, define the gospel in seven words. Okay. So there's a woman who teaches at a seminary in the South. And she, when she was asked to define the gospel in seven words, it was really fascinating. I read the article and I didn't write down all of the, some, some theologians and pastors used more than seven words. You know, I know you're shocked, right? Some use less. But this woman, Ellen Cherry, I forget her last name, she used this passage from Ephesians. And so when she was asked to define the gospel in seven words, she said this, the wall of hostility has come down. So for her, that's the definition of the good news. The wall of hostility has come down. Because scripture defines us not by who we are not, but by who we are. One people, the church. And because of that, because of Christ's sacrifice, we're no longer alienated from God, which is how we are in our sins and struggles, but reconciled with God and each other. So that's the root. We are one people. And the fruit of that unity is to acknowledge it, to not let the world define us, but scripture defines us. To love each other beyond the barriers of our differences and to serve each other because of them. To bring the outsiders in wherever and whoever they are. Okay, that's the first route. The second route is that because of Jesus, we can see in these passages that we have a purpose and a place to call us to serve. 
a place to be called to. Paul tells the Ephesians that unity means being built into a dwelling place, a house for God's service. We are the church, Paul says. You are the church. I think if we learned anything through this pandemic, especially at the beginning when we shut down our building, right, and we worshiped virtually only, as did so many churches all across the country and all across the world, we learned that the church isn't so much the building as it is the people who serve inside it. Now, this place, this church, Eagle River Presbyterian Church, is for most of us, the ones in here and some of the ones who are sharing, who are worshiping virtually, it's for most of us the primary place, the primary way that we serve. Paul the Apostle puts it in the present tense. We are being built into God's house. I quoted you, I read to you that passage from Jeremiah because Jeremiah was talking about people who serve but don't build up the kingdom, don't serve God's people. Israel was in exile. Israel was suffering and lost because of their sin and their disobedience and the wicked kings. And God's people needed good shepherds to care for them, to heal and teach and proclaim the gospel, just like Jesus sent out the disciples from, in that passage from Mark. God's people needed then and need now a purpose, which is serving God's kingdom, which is the place where God's will is done. So that's our root, that we have a purpose and a place because we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a specific time, right? What's today? July 18th, 2021, with a specific people. And this place is our place in which to serve God. And the fruit of that root of our identity is, again, the acknowledgement that it's God's house. God's the cornerstone. God is the rock. And we then are being built as we love like the shepherd and as we serve God and each other into God's house. So finally, the third root beyond a purpose and a place is that we have a person to lead us and teach us. So Jim Edwards, a New Testament scholar in his commentary on Mark's gospel, says the pre first prerequisite of discipleship, the first prerequisite of learning to follow Jesus, is being with Jesus, like the apostles, right? Jesus sent them out and they came back and they were like, look it, here's what we did, right? Jesus sends us out to do his work and we come back here. And we tell God what we've been doing for him through the power of his spirit. The disciples reported everything to Jesus, all that they did, and had compassion like he did. Because did you hear that verse in Mark, Jesus, so he tried to get away for some quiet time with the disciples, and the crowds, and he was sailing across the north shore of the lake, and the crowds figured out where he was going, and they met him when he anchored the boat and went ashore. And Jesus really wanted some downtime with his disciples, right? He was tired and he needed rest, but he had compassion on them for they were like sheep without a shepherd. That's been the classic image of kingship and leadership in the Old Testament. He had compassion. In Greek, in the New Testament, that word is only used of Jesus, that, that particular word. And it's the word that um, literally means guts right? It, he had compassion. His, his sense of love and care for those people that were literally with sheep without, like sheep without a shepherd was so deep in him that it was all the way down inside, right? That word is splankna. It kind of sounds, you know, like guts or something, intestines, right? That's the kind of compassion to the very bottom of his soul, to the bottom of his being that Jesus had for the crowds, and Jesus said, so we have to look for those kind of shepherds for my people. The flock here 
is universal. Paul the Apostle makes it clear. There's no longer foreigners or strangers. You've all been called. You've all been united. You're no longer Gentile or Jew. You're all one people. Because... As David was told, so here I'm going, jumping around, but here there's David, and he's been crowned king, and he's brought the ark back to Jerusalem, and he's settled, and he has no longer wars with any of the surrounding nations, at least for a little while. And he says, here I am, living in a palace built of cedar. So cedar was the primary building, luxurious building material, okay, in that time and place of cedar. And the ark of God, the very place where God's spirit dwells, lives in a tent. So David has this grand plan to build God a house, the temple. And God told David through the prophet Nathan that God's house isn't primarily a place, but a person. David didn't get it right. So one of the things I read this week was that in David's time, the kings in the ancient Near East regularly built temples for their gods to honor them and to provide a place for them, but also to gain honor for, honor for themselves as the builders of the temple. And by building the temple, what the kings thought they were doing is bringing the god to one place, to the king's place, where they would have regular access, where the king would have regular access to the god. And so making temples in that time and place was part of domesticating the gods, okay? Was making a little captive god in a little box or a magnificent palace in the, in the capital. And bringing the god food and drink, right? How many times have we seen pictures of the pyramids, right? And when, the, when they've not excavated, but when they've gone in and found the pyramid, they've sent people off to the, ne to the eternal rest or whatever the Egyptians would have called death with food and drink. And so that's what they did. They put God in a bit, in a, either in a little box or in a magnificent palace and brought the God food and drink so that they could keep God captive and that God would serve them instead of them serving God. But Nathan, God says through Nathan the prophet to David, the temple... God's house is not primarily a place, but a people. Paul tells the Ephesians and us that in him, the whole building is joined together with Jesus Christ as our cornerstone. So our roots are a person to lead us, a place, and the acknowledgement that we are one people. And then the fruit here is to acknowledge who leads us. So a long time ago in this church, we had a family and they had a little girl who had two older brothers. This is not my family, okay, although it would have been true. This family had a little girl who had two older brothers and she was forever saying to them, you are not the boss of me, okay? You are not, she wasn't saying that to her parents, she was saying that to her two older brothers who, you know, tried to boss her around. She would say, you are not the boss of me. What we acknowledge when we come as God's people is that there is somebody, there's a lot of people we can say, you are not the boss of me. But there is somebody who gets to play that role. It's Jesus Christ, our good shepherd. It's God, because in Jesus Christ, God loves us beyond measure. We are the bricks. That's our fruit. We are the bricks that God is using to love and serve and care for God's people. No matter what divides us. If you don't hear anything from this sermon today, what I want else, what I want you to hear is that no matter what divides us, and there's so much in the world that divides us, right? There's politics. There's nationality, there's ethnicity, there's gender, there's vaccine status, there's masking, there's age, there's, uh, you name it. There's so much that builds walls between God's people. But in Jesus Christ, the gospel says the wall of hostility has come down. And there are no more barriers between God's servants. 
So friends, God's looking for good shepherds. And I'm here to tell you that he's found them in you, in me, in all of God's wonderful people as God makes his home in us. Alleluia. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and almighty God, we thank you for all the ways, all the walls that you break down so that we can come together in this place and in so many other places to serve you, to tell your good news to all your people, and to celebrate the fact that wherever we are, whether we're present in this room or present in our living room or out enjoying your beautiful world today, you unite us in the power of your spirit and you are building each of us person by person, brick by brick into your temple, your holy place where your spirit dwells forever with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone of our faith and our lives. We pray in his holy and mighty name. Amen. And how can we pray for each other this day and this week? Do you have joys and concerns to share? Anyone? Yes, Matthew. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 Wow. Okay. So she's getting better and then it's a miraculous recovery. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Last week I said there would be a rose on the pulpit to honor our new granddaughter. And so there's still going to be a rose on the pulpit to honor our new granddaughter. But she's really happy where she is. (laughs) So um, soon, I hope, we'll get to meet her. Anybody else? Yes, Jean. Okay. So friends getting tested for cancer or surgery. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Joys and concerns? Okay. I know there's still um, people in uh, the Miami area. They've now, right, they're not going to find anybody alive in that horrible condo complex. And I know I've seen pictures on the news over the last couple days of the terrible floods in Germany, right? Whole villages just um, kind of obliterated by the flood. So there's a lot, a lot of suffering in the world. So let's pray together. Holy and almighty God, we thank you that we are your people and that every week, every moment, if we do so, you welcome us into your presence and you call us to turn to you in the power of your spirit. We thank you for this new week that you've given us, a new week in which to serve and to love and to relax, to take joy in the fellowship we share and in the wonders of your creation. We thank you for this beautiful world, for these warm days here in South Central Alaska, and for the ways in which all your creation shouts your praise. We thank you for time off sometimes with our families and our friends, our loved ones, and for good work to do, work that builds up your kingdom and serves you and your people. We pray for so many people who are suffering today. We think of people in Miami who've lost loved ones, for people in Germany who, who are suffering devastating floods, for people in Canada and in the lower 48 where there are horrible fires in so many different places. We pray for people who are suffering in body and mind and spirit, for people who are facing surgery or recovering from it, for people who are getting tested for possible cancer. We pray for their healing and their help and their wholeness. We pray for those whose struggles are not of the body, but of the mind and spirit, for those who are facing depression, for those who are struggling with addiction, for those whose families are torn and broken by anger and years of bitterness. 
We pray that all who need to feel your healing touch today would find it. And that you would make yourself known to our loved ones in a powerful way that they can't miss. We thank you for this miraculous recovery of a young mom. And we pray that she would continue to recover so that she can take up her life again. We pray for new babies coming soon. And for all our kids and grandkids, our parents and our grandparents, our siblings. For that wonderful web of relationships that nurtures and sustains and supports us wherever we are. We pray for those who are leading us in churches, in cities, state, nation. That those who need rest would find it and those who need wise counsel would listen. We thank you that you've gathered us here to sing your songs and tell your story. And for the gift that it is to worship you in this place. And now we pray that you would hear us as together we pray the prayer that Christ our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I forgot to mention that Reverend Alice Green, many of us knew her in the presbytery. She died um, six months ago at 103. And she was one of the first women to be ordained in the PCUSA. She worshiped on, she led the congregation on St. Lawrence Island for many, many years. Um, when she had to go out to St. Lawrence Island by ship and take a whole year's worth of, um, of supplies with her. So Alice died six months ago and her funeral is this coming Wednesday on the six month anniversary of her death at Trinity Presbyterian Church. So if anyone would like to go, Trinity asks that you RSVP, you let Trinity know, just call them so that they can plan for social distancing and fellowship. But the visitation is at one and the service is at two. So any of you who knew Reverend Alice Green um, and you want to attend her service at Trinity on Wednesday afternoon. So the food pantry is having their annual volunteer picnic next Sunday. So if you've volunteered for the food pantry, please, uh, you're welcome to come and go to the picnic. And the music family has coordinated the work on the front of the building, so you can see that the front of the building was painted. There was also a, a young missionary group that was visiting from Georgia. They came this week and helped too. We're still collecting clothes for Highland Mountain. The box is out there. You can drop in anything. They're, they welcome your contributions. And finally, here's the ways you can keep up with your financial stewardship. If you've brought a gift today, the offering plates are in the back. We couldn't serve our community and our world without all the ways that you help. Yes, Matthew. Sorry, I have a uh, leftover prayer. Oh, sorry, okay. Yes, yes. Yep. That's right. So I should have mentioned that. So Beulah Nopakahawk, who's the commission pastor from Gamble, her granddaughter is very ill. The clinic on the island isn't able to care for her, and she needs either to come to Nome or to the Native Medical Center here. But the weather is keeping the planes grounded, the little planes. So thanks, Matthew. So if you could remember, I don't know her name, the granddaughter's name, but if you could remember uh, Beulah's granddaughter in your prayers. Okay. Our closing hymn is... Called as partners in Christ's service, it's number 761. Please stand and let's pray t and let's sing together.
Amen and amen. And now, good friends, hear this good news. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. Christ who indwells you has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in God's grace and love and power. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ever ask or imagine according to God's power that is at work within us. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and forever. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Have a good week, everybody. If you're here, there's fellowship outside.